Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. And today we're gonna to look at three stories that demonstrate that. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, the next time you're in a very crowded parking lot and you see the like button driving around looking for a spot, flag them down and point to your car suggesting you're gonna leave and then go to your car and stand there fumbling for your keys for a few minutes and then just walk away. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 1918, during World War I, British soldier Henry Tandy found himself stationed inside of a trench in northern France. By this point, Henry was already considered a war hero, and he would go on to become the most decorated British soldier in World War I. But his awards are not what he is remembered for. On September 28th of that year, after a long day of fighting, Henry was propped up on the edge of his trench, looking out towards the German line. It was dark and quiet, and there was mist in the air, and at some point, Henry noticed a figure way off in the distance walking towards him. Henry instinctively raised his rifle, but he didn't pull the trigger. He wanted to make sure who he was shooting was his enemy because it could be one of their own men who got wounded and was making his way back to the trench. And so Henry's looking down his gun, staring at this guy, waiting to figure out who he is. And after a few seconds, out of the mist walks a badly wounded German soldier, so it is his enemy, but he wasn't carrying a weapon and he didn't appear to understand he was walking directly into Henry's sights. Henry aimed his rifle right at this German man's heart, but he didn't pull the trigger. And the man just continued to walk directly towards Henry until he got about 30 meters away, at which point he stopped and looked up and realized his mistake. But instead of trying to run away, he just stood there and stared at Henry, seeming to accept the fact that he was about to die. Now, Henry had shot many men during the war so far, but he just could not bring himself to shoot this unarmed, wounded German who just looked kind of pathetic. And so with Henry's gun still up, he glanced to his left and he glanced to his right to make sure nobody was watching. None of his comrades were going to see this. And then he lowered his gun. And then Henry and this German man just stared at each other for a while until the German man just nodded his thanks, turned around and wandered back into the mist out of sight. The man Henry had just saved was Adolf Hitler. In the early morning hours of June 10th, 1994, Deborah Hoyt suddenly woke up in the middle of the night. She and her husband were staying with relatives in Sacramento, California, and they were supposed to be there for the next couple of days. But as she was sitting there, she had this overwhelming urge to want to leave right then and there and head back to their home in Lake Tahoe. Because she didn't really know what to make of this overwhelming feeling, she shook her husband awake and told him about it. She thought that maybe something was wrong. And he said, you know what? You probably just had a bad dream and you're kind of waking up still half in your dream. It's not a big deal. Just go back to bed. I'm sure everything is totally fine. And in the morning, if you still want to, I'd be happy to leave. And so Deborah said, yeah, you're right. I'm totally overreacting. I'm sure it was just a dream. And she laid back down to try to go back to sleep. But as she laid there, that sense of dread that something was wrong and that she had to leave right now, it was just growing and growing and growing until she just jumped out of the bed and she's just standing in the room and she says to her husband, honey, we gotta go right now. I don't know what's wrong, but we gotta go right now. And her husband did not wanna go. And he said, come on, Deborah, get back in bed. It's not a big deal. But she was adamant. She said, get out of bed, we're leaving right now. And so begrudgingly, her husband said, okay, we'll leave right now. And so the two of them hastily packed up and then went Went downstairs and left a note for their relatives explaining their absence and then they got in their car and they drove off. After a little while the couple reached a very dangerous section of their journey back home. It was called Bullion Bend and it was a very windy road up in the mountains where one wrong turn and you're going flying down the side of a mountain. After driving through this area for about 15 minutes they rounded a particularly sharp turn and as soon as they made the turn and could look down the road Deborah, who was in the passenger seat she saw up ahead on the right off the side of the road several feet something that was just lying there on the side of the road she didn't know what it was she thought it was maybe a bag or some trash or maybe a dead animal and at first she was just going to dismiss it but as her husband drove closer and closer to it the light began to illuminate it and she looked at it and couldn't really discern what it was until they were right next to it and she looked out her window and she noticed it was a woman's body a woman who had no clothes on who was just lying there totally motionless and deborah immediately turns to her husband and says honey i just saw 
saw a dead woman on the side of the road. And her husband immediately is kind of panicked and doesn't slow down. He just keeps driving and says, hey, you know, should we stop? Should we turn around? I mean, maybe she's not dead. Maybe we can help her. But Deborah at this point is now terrified. And she's saying, no, keep going. Don't go back. I bet it's a trap. Someone probably put her there and they're going to lure us in and they're going to attack us if we try to stop and help her. And so in this kind of chaotic, frenzied reaction that Deborah and her husband are having, they decide that their best course of action is just to drive on and find the next payphone and call the police. And it just so happened that less than a quarter of a mile away was a ranger station with a phone. And so they pull into the parking lot and Deborah calls the police. The police tell her to wait inside of her car and they'll be out in a couple of minutes and they're going to need her to bring them up to where she saw this body. So a couple of minutes goes by, the police show up, and they tell them to drive back up the road, but stop about 200 yards short of where you believe this woman's body is. And so Deborah and her husband, they get back in the car, they drive back up the road where they came from, and right at this point where the road turned very sharply is where Deborah knew on the other side of this turn would be this body. And so they pulled over on the side of the road, the police came up on their side, and they said, yep, right around the corner, you're gonna find her lying on the ground on the left side. And so Deborah and her husband are just sitting in the car watching as the police go up, they make that turn and they kind of disappear out of sight. And then they see their spotlight moving around on the other side of this turn. And so they figure, okay, they're looking for the body. But after several minutes, the police came back down the road and they stopped next to Deborah's car. And they said, you know what, guys, we didn't see anything up there. There wasn't a body. There wasn't anything out of the ordinary. And Deborah would say to police, I'm not lying. I know what I saw. It was a woman's body right there in front of me. I know it. It's right over there. And they would tell her that we believe you you, but we can't do anything because there's nothing up there. And so they told Deborah and her husband to just head home, and they did. After Deborah and her husband took off and were gone, the two responding officers drove back to their police station, and once they were inside, they began speculating about what Deborah might have seen. And as they were talking, another officer came into the station, a guy by the name of Rich Strasser, and he overhears them, and he goes over. He's intrigued, and he asked them, you know, what happened? What did you see? And they explained to him that this woman, Deborah, had spotted a supposed dead woman's body up on Bullion Bend. And as soon as he heard Bullion Bend, Rich remembered that just a couple of days ago, they had received a missing person report of a young woman named Christine Skubish and her young son named Nick, who had gone missing, and the last place they had been seen was up on Bullion Bend. And so Rich wondered if maybe there was a body up there, and maybe it was Christine's. And so the next morning, Rich got up early, and he headed out to Bullion Bend, and when he reached the exact spot where Deborah had claimed to have seen this dead woman's body, he found a children's shoe. And so he stopped his car, he got out, he picked the shoe up, and he's looking around, and he's looking for anything else that's out of the ordinary, but there's nothing on the road, there's no skid marks, there's no other debris, there's no other clothes, there's nothing. And so he walks over to the guardrail that overlooks this very steep embankment, and he looks down the other side, and at first all he sees is just trees everywhere, but as he's looking, he thinks he sees more clothing farther down the mountain. And so he climbs over the guardrail, and he very carefully maneuvers his way down and after only a couple of seconds, he reaches a clearing in the branches and the trees, and he can see down to where the train kind of levels off, and right down there is a smashed up red four-door sedan. It was the same type of car that Christine Skubish had been driving when she went missing. And so Rich ran down the mountain, following debris all the way to this wrecked car. He goes around to the driver's side, and he looks inside, and there in the driver's seat is Christine Skubish, and unfortunately, she was deceased. And then on the passenger seat is her son, Nikki, and he he is alive, but barely. He had gone five days without food or water. And doctors would say when Rich found him, he probably only had about one, maybe two hours before he would have died as well. Authorities believe Christine fell asleep at the wheel and she drove off that embankment. Initially, Rich believed Deborah must have seen Christine when she was driving through the mountains and saw that woman on the side of the road. After her accident, Christine must have gotten out of her car and then climbed up that embankment and then laid on the road, hoping someone would see her and then when no one stopped for her, she went back down to her car where she ultimately died. But according to the coroner, that would have been impossible because when Christine crashed off the road, she died on impact five days before Deborah saw that woman on the side of the road. So it could not have been Christine. To this day, no one knows for sure who or what Deborah saw on the side of the road. But it is objectively true that Rich only investigated Bully and Bend and 
found Nikki alive because of Deborah's police report about this dead woman on the side of the road. And Deborah was only on that road because she'd had this totally weird middle of the night urge to suddenly leave a relative's house and drive up into the mountains, something she had never felt before and didn't really know how to explain. So either this is an extremely strange set of circumstances, or Nikki had a guardian angel. In early 1983, residents of the Cranley Gardens apartment complex in North London began complaining about their drains being clogged up. Initially, their landlord was dismissive and said, oh, it's just an old building, it's old plumbing, and that's why it's slow. But eventually, the landlord conceded and asked a plumber to come out and have a look. And so, on the evening of February 8th, an experienced plumber named Mike came out to Cranley Gardens, and after learning what the complaints were, he went around to the side of the building and he opened up a drain cover to have a look inside. As expected, when he shined his light down, he saw wads of hair and napkins and other things kind of mashed together, clogging up the pipes. And so he reached in and he began pulling the stuff out and putting it in a bucket right next to him. And then after he had cleared the majority of the obstruction, he reached his arm all the way into this pipe to feel around to see if there was anything in there that he just couldn't see. And at some point as he was reaching, when his arm was almost completely into this pipe, his hand hit a major blockage. And so he moved his fingers around to try to feel what it was, but he couldn't tell. It was something that was fairly soft, but there were some hard things inside of it, like sticks or rods. So he grabbed a handful of this blockage and he pulled his arm back out of the pipe. He opened his hand and what he was holding looked like ground meat, but it wasn't any meat he had ever seen before. And inside of this fleshy substance looked like little bits of bone. Now, Mike had cleared many pipes before and he had never seen meat be the reason for a blockage. And so this whole situation just seemed really strange. And he decided, you know, it's late. I'll just come back tomorrow with my supervisor so he can see what this is too. So Mike puts the cap back on the drain pipe and he walks out from behind the building back out towards his truck parked on the road. And as he's walking, two of the residents of this complex come out and they say, hey, did you fix the blockage? You know, what was it? And Mike would say, no, he hadn't. And then he just kind of blurted out that there was meat in the pipes. That was what was causing the blockage. And then one of these two residents says, well, I bet people are just flushing their Kentucky Fried Chicken down the drains. That's what's causing it. And Mike looked at him and he was like, yeah, maybe. And then he just turned around, got in his truck, and he drove away. Early the next morning, Mike and his supervisor came back to Cranley Gardens, and they went around to the side of the building, they undid that cap, and then Mike reached down inside, expecting to feel this blockage, but where it should have been, there was nothing. Somebody had cleared the pipes. And so Mike and his supervisor are looking at each other, and Mike is like, there's no way that cleared on its own. Someone had to have come out here and cleared it, but I don't know why they would have done that and still had us come out. But the men decide, you know what, maybe by chance it did just kind of slip through and cleared itself. So let's just continue the process and make sure each of the apartment buildings, their individual pipe is unobstructed. And when they checked these pipes, they found all of them were clear, except for one, apartment number 23, whose pipe was blocked up with more of this meaty substance. Mike and his partner were already very suspicious of the fact that someone had snuck out here in the middle of the night and cleared the pipe, probably. They didn't know if that happened, but it seemed likely. And now they're finding more of this weird meat substance coming from a particular apartment. And so the whole situation just seemed off. And so they told the landlord that they were not gonna touch this. Somebody else had to come out and deal with this. And the landlord, after finding out there was meat jammed in the pipes, got really freaked out and called the police. The police showed up, they pulled this meat substance out of the pipes and they sent it to a mortuary where a pathologist looked at it and said, this is meat. It's human meat. And in particular, the stuff that was pulled out of apartment number 23's pipes is that of a human neck. So the police go back to Cranley Gardens. They go up to apartment number 23. They knock on the door. And when the door opens, they're hit with this overwhelming stench of just rotting flesh. And standing in the doorway of this apartment, the owner of the apartment, is this guy who's in his late 30s, early 40s, who introduces himself as Dennis Nielsen. And they say, hey, Dennis, can we have a look around your apartment? And he says, you know, why? And they say, well, we found human remains in your pipes. And Dennis immediately says, oh my goodness, I can't believe that, that's horrible. But the police are not buying it. And they say, you know what, Dennis, tell us where the rest of the body is. And at this, Dennis suddenly went expressionless, emotionless, and he just turns around and he points into his bedroom and he says, it's in two plastic bags in my closet. And so before the police go into his apartment to go inspect these bags, they say, Dennis, are there any other bodies in your apartment that we should know about? And Dennis sighs and he looks up to the ceiling and says, 
Yeah, there's about 15 or 16 here. It's a long story, it goes way back. I'd love to tell it to you, get this off my chest, and I'll do it at the police station. So after Dennis was arrested and brought to the station, he told them his horrible story. It had all started five years earlier in 1978 when Dennis was 33. He was at a pub having some drinks by himself when a teenager came into the bar and attempted to buy an alcoholic drink and he was denied service. And so Dennis pulled him aside and said, hey, I'd be happy to give you a drink at my apartment. It's right down the road. And the young man whose name was Steven was very excited about this and said, great, let's go. Once they arrived back and they were up in Dennis's apartment, the pair had lots of drinks and they were having fun and laughing. And then at some point the pair climbed into bed together. The next morning, when Dennis got up, his new friend, Stephen, was still sleeping right next to him. And he had this sudden, overwhelming sense of dread because he knew as soon as Stephen woke up, he would see this as a one-night stand and he would just leave. He would not stick around and remain friends with Dennis. And Dennis just did not like that idea. He wanted Stephen to stay. And so he looked on the ground next to the bed and he saw the necktie that Stephen had been wearing was on the ground. And so he got on the ground, he grabbed the necktie, he fashioned it into a noose, and then he climbed back back on the bed, got on top of Steven's chest, and he looped the tie around his neck, and then he pulled it as tight as he could. And as soon as it was tight, Dennis would tell police that Steven came alive, and he began reaching for his neck and kicking Dennis as hard as he could, but he just can't get it off. And at some point, Dennis said Steven just seemed to give up. He looked up at Dennis and knew he wasn't going to get this off, and that Dennis was determined to kill him. And so Steven just allowed himself to go limp, and then he slouched over. And as soon as that happened, Dennis said he relaxed. But as he's looking at Steven, he realized he wasn't dead. He was just unconscious. And so Dennis goes into the kitchen and he gets this huge plastic bucket and he fills it up with water and he sets it in the middle of his kitchen floor. And then he gets a bunch of kitchen chairs and he lines them up like a table right in front of this bucket of water. And then he drags Steven's body into the kitchen and he lays him on his back on these chairs, but make sure his head is not resting on the chair. His head is kind of dangling off the back of these chairs. And then he grabbed that bucket of water and he slid it right underneath Stephen's head. And then Dennis got on top of the chairs, on top of Stephen, and then he pressed the young man's face straight down so his head went backwards until his mouth and his nose were under the water. And Dennis held him like that until Stephen regained consciousness, but again, he didn't fight it, he knew he was doomed, and after several minutes, the bubble stopped coming to the surface and Stephen was dead. Dennis pulled his victim off of the chairs, he brought him into the living room and he sat him on a chair, and then Dennis went into the kitchen and he made himself a cup of coffee and he smoked some cigarettes and then he just stood in the doorway and looked at Steven's body. And he would tell police it was a very bizarre experience because Steven still looked like he was alive. In fact, Dennis would try talking to him as if he was going to talk back, but obviously he didn't. And at some point, Dennis realized, you know, the life he had before he killed Steven was now over. He had a new life and he didn't really know how to handle it. And so the first thing he thought to do was to clean Steven. So he took Steven's body and he brought him into the bathroom and he gave him a very long bath, cleaned his body, cleaned his hair. And then afterwards he got him out, he dressed him and put him into his bed. And then Dennis climbed into bed with him and laid with him. And he would tell police as he laid there, he suddenly felt overjoyed. Steven was not going to leave him. He was going to stay here as long as Dennis wanted him to. After laying with him for some time, Dennis realized he had to find a way to hide Steven's body in his apartment so no one could find him. And so he left his apartment and he went to a hardware store where he got an electric knife and a big storage bin. And he brought them back to his apartment and as he was about to cut Stephen up, he just couldn't go through with it. So instead, he just climbed into bed and took a nap next to Stephen's body. When he got up again, he moved Stephen's body onto the ground in his living room and covered him with a blanket. And then he went and made dinner and then sat in his chair in the living room right next to this body on the ground and watched TV for a while. When he was done watching TV and eating, he looked at the body on the floor and realized, you know, he really hadn't made any progress in terms of hiding him somewhere in his apartment. And that's when he remembered he had a loose floorboard in his apartment. And so he went over to the loose floorboard, he pulled it up and he saw there was a space under the floors. And so he pulled a couple more boards up and then he grabbed Steven's body and he attempted to force him down into the space. But by now, Steven's body had begun to stiffen up from rigor mortis. Specifically, his arms were outstretched like a Y over his head. And so as Dennis is trying to force him down in there, his arms were not allowing him to go down into that small space. So Dennis took Stephen's body and he propped him up against the wall in his bedroom. So the body is against the wall, rigid, standing up with its arms up over its head and Stephen's eyes were still open. And then after that, Dennis just got in bed and fell asleep. So all night, this corpse is staring at Dennis in his bed. And then the next morning when Dennis got up, 
There was Steven, still up against the wall with his hands in the air looking down at him. Dennis grabbed Steven's body and put it on the ground and he began yanking and jerking and pulling on each of Steven's arms until they were pinned down by his side. And then after that, Dennis started working on his legs and his hips and he began contorting him until he was small enough that he could pack him down under his floor. And then once he was under there, he just put the boards on top and went about his daily life. And for the next couple of days, he totally forgot about Steven. But a week after putting him under the floor, Dennis decided he missed Steven and he wanted to see him again. And so one night he opened up the floorboards, he looked down and there was Steven. And Dennis would say, it looked like he was dirty. So he pulled him out of the floor and he gave him another bath. And then after he had cleaned Steven, he pulled him out of the water, he dried him off and he put him in the chair. And then Dennis took a bath himself in the same water he had just used to clean Steven. After a long soak in this tub, Dennis finally got out. He toweled himself off, he redressed Steven, and then he forced him back onto the floorboards and covered him up again. And he would remain there for the next seven months until Dennis finally decided to dispose of him by burning him in a bonfire outside of their apartment building. And then after the body was completely incinerated and gone, Dennis remembered thinking, I can't believe I just got away with murder. And so he would do it again and again and again, killing at least 15 young men from North London, all by strangulation or by drowning or a combination of the two. And after he killed them, he would keep them stashed in his apartment for months at a time, in his closet, in his cabinets, in his bed, under the floors, all over his apartment, he had these bodies. And while these bodies were in his apartment, he liked to periodically take them out to spend time with them. He would tell police he found corpses to be beautiful. He was fascinated by them. But eventually, in 1983, he had so many bodies stashed all over his apartment that he knew he really needed to expedite getting rid of them. And so he began cutting them up and trying to force them down his drain, which eventually clogged the pipes. And so when Mike the plumber showed up and discovered this meaty substance in the pipes, and Dennis overheard him talking about it, that night after Mike was gone, Dennis had gone out outside and attempted to clear the rest of the remains from the pipes. But he wasn't aware there were still remains stuck in the pipe that led to his specific apartment. Dennis Nielsen confessed to killing 15 young men and attempting to kill at least seven others, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Dennis never showed any remorse, nor did he show any desire to want to be free again. He actually said he deserved to be in jail for what he did. In 2018, Dennis Nielsen would die in prison at the age of 72. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's video, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it so give us the timestamp and if you're the first to do that we will pin you at the top of the comment section if you got something out of today's video and you haven't done this already the next time you're in a very crowded parking lot and you see the like button driving around looking for a spot flag them down and point to your parked car as if you're gonna leave and then go over to your car and spend a few minutes fumbling for your keys before just walking away also please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three or four video uploads if you want to get in touch with me you can direct message me on instagram or on twitter my username for both platforms is the same it's john ballin 416 i also have a ton of content over on tiktok where my username is mr ballin i also have a second youtube channel called mr ballin shorts where i post random short videos and lost episodes if you have a story suggestion please submit it to our subreddit just called mr ballin it's linked in the description below so whether i see you on instagram twitter tiktok reddit youtube or some combination just know that i really appreciate your support and until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.